Okay. Hi, and welcome to Governance Alive's podcast. I'm your host, Katrina Knight. I'm an associate at GA, and we're here today with John Buck, one of the founders of Governance Alive. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. I know from us working together that you really enjoy science and psychology. What really draws you to those subjects, John? Well, um, actually, I'm, I'm just curious about all kinds of stuff. And I like science, and I also like a bunch of other things that are related to uh, the different kinds of intelligences. So science is what I would call a logical, mathematical intelligence, and you can get all into that and measure things and, and all that kind of stuff, do mathematics. But um, there's like eight or nine or 10 um, different kinds of intelligences, they call them. Um, and so I like spatial things. I like you know going to the Hirshhorn Museum and downtown here in Washington and seeing all kinds of weird new things that have come up with, or I really like the game of Go. And that's not really science, but it's like, wow, you really have to be thinking, you know, in very abstract spatial ways. Um, I like bodily kinesthetic things, which is, again, it's not science, but I like dancing. I like, I like going to India because everybody sits on the floor and, wow, that's really so different, eating on the floor, all that kind of thing. And um, so that's a, a another area that I like a lot. Um, musical is another kind of intelligence. Like I was out at the Grand Canyon recently, and they had some people who were Hopis out there playing on flutes. And it was like, wow, it just makes you float to, to hear the, that kind of other otherworldly music, it sounds like. Certainly just different culture. So I really like music and hip hop and and Beethoven and electronic music like Stockhausen, all kinds of stuff like that. That's all very interesting. And because it's new and different and gives me different perspectives on things. Linguistics, I wrote a paper once with a couple of other professors. Uh, I wasn't a professor, but they were um, talking about the meaning of words in English. And, and I ran into this as a big problem because I discovered like sociocracy in uh, Holland, and I had to learn Dutch in order to get the, the translation done because the, there wasn't much translated. It was before uh, Google Translate. And I discovered that there were things I could say in Dutch that I couldn't say in English, which was like a shock to me, but it was really there. And so I, I really like digging into where words come from in English, like all of our, our um, emotions are pretty much carried on the Anglo-Saxon side of our language. English is like three languages piled one on top of the other, Viking, Anglo-Saxon, and French. And so you, if you're drowning, you yell help, which is Anglo-Saxon, not aid, which is French. Um, if you're getting married, you exchange rings, not circles, and so on. And it all goes back. It shows how long, how, how really the incredibly um, slow uh, culture is to change ba at a basic level. All this comes from 1066 when William the Conqueror came in and imposed French, just plopped French on top of the English language or on the Anglo Saxon language. And so we end up with, you know, a farmer will grow a cow, uh, then we eat beef. Or in uh, the United States, we might kill a rattlesnake and we eat rattlesnake there's only one word for it because there were no rattlesnakes in england in 1066 so on and on it goes it's very interesting things and um the the um i was in korea recently and koreans can say a lot of things we can't say and it's all very interesting um there's interpersonal uh and emotional intelligence kinds of skills and that's really important because they have lots of data now that says that teams are effective only for two reasons. One is that everybody on the team has really high emotional intelligence. And the other is that um, they, they make sure that they all talk uh, about the same amount of time in, in a team meeting. So when we are talking about sociocracy, building people's emotional intelligence as we teach them is it's something that can be done and is very important to help the team really work well. So those are the kinds of things that, that I'm interested in. Science is just one of them. Uh, and I really think that um, the, the 
awareness of all the different kinds of intelligence that we have helps everybody work better together. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially uh, emotional intelligence goes a long way with with people in general. And that really ties in to uh, what I wanted to ask you about um, be because we both share that love of science and psychology and we're discovering so much more on those subjects every day. We're always expanding, we're always researching, we're continuing to grow those subjects to broader and broader. So when I think about science and psychology, it's really just kind of like an umbrella and there's so much that stems from it that goes in different directions. One of those is uh, consciousness, <laughs> which, which you know we've talked about before and you know, I think a lot of us, when we think of consciousness, we just think about the definition of it, but it goes so much deeper than that, mm. I feel like. So could you maybe expand on that to help like me and others under have a, a little bit of a deeper understanding? Yes. At Governance Live, we really are into helping people have effective teams. And understanding consciousness is really important in that. In consciousness, if you're like conscious, there's there's one aspect of it that's fairly straightforward and observable, and another side of it that's like real super deep mystery. For example, you can pretty much tell if somebody is conscious or not. If they're going like that, they're not conscious. If they are not responding to you in some way, they're not conscious. When they get up and you can see them relating to the world, then you know they're conscious. And that is the same sort of thing with a team. Team, if it's awake and it is together, it's, it's like having a common aim or a common mission, then it will relate to that common mission as a team. One of the things I like to do is play, um, capture the flag with girl, uh, with girls, children, girls and boys. And we have a good time. And what I have them do is they'll play for a little while and somebody will capture the flag and bring it over the line. And then I make them switch the teams around. And then they go at it again. I like to have them think about that afterwards and say, you know, did you, how did you feel when we switched teams? Did you feel like, you know, you were together? I, oh, yeah, yeah, we were. So it's having that common goal, a common thing that the team is doing creates the same kind of behavior, really, that a single person does, where you're relating to something, you want to do something, and you're relating to the world, and you can be aware that you're conscious. The deeper, more difficult problem about consciousness is that you can't observe it. Like, Katrina, you're looking at me now, and I've kind of got a green shirt on, and, and I've got some you know funky-looking binders and books in the back. But I don't know. I can't observe what those look like to you 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 have red hair does somebody else perceive the same thing we cannot see somebody's consciousness it's the one thing really in the world that there's no way to observe what's happening you can you know put a bunch of electrodes on your head and you can see electrical pulses going around and or you can measure um dopamine and and uh all kinds of other chemicals that are going through your brain so we know that it's in there functioning, but we don't know what that conscious sensation is. We can't observe it. And in the same way with a team, you can't really observe what the team consciousness is. You can see the team working together as if it were a conscious being, but you can't see, nobody can see what that team consciousness is or what it's perceiving. And the there, there's a nice analogy in nature uh, that is related to octopuses. Octopuses are fascinating animals. They, Some of you may have seen my video about octopuses, and if you do, you'll know that octopuses have nine brains. How many is that? Yeah, nine, nine brains. And it's each leg has a brain, and then there's a central brain, and that central brain is not a command and control system like our brains. It's more like a facilitator, as far as they can tell. And each 
leg in an octopus has a different personality. There's shy ones and sexy ones and, and adventurous <laughs> ones, and they you can see it. And those brains can talk to each other without going through the central system, so they can coordinate. And the central system can say, oh, hey, everybody, there's a crab over there, let's go get it. And they'll all coordinate together and go get it. So that octopus is about as close as you're going to get to a true team consciousness. Sometimes when I'm teaching this idea, I'll have people in the workshop when we are not trying to teach on Zoom, but we actually are live, I'll have them create a thumb ring, maybe eight people for eight arms of the octopus. And you have to hold on to that. And you have to start moving around. And I tell them, you can't talk, just kind of sense. And they start moving around and they do all kinds of things. And there's no ninth brain. So that's the problem humans have is building that ninth brain, that facilitator function, which is why you need a facilitator in general when you're trying to do a team meeting. Although you can try to do it without it, it's generally easier to have that coordinating function and a central memory. Like you need to take notes when you're on a team of human beings because you don't have that ninth brain off there uh, keeping a collective memory you've got your own individual memory and that may remember some of the things you're doing but you need that central memory and so there there teams i really think get conscious you can't see the consciousness nobody can observe it but they act conscious and they can be more awake and more conscious if they have the discipline of coordinating the team together doing the central facilitation and being aware that they've got a common mission then the team can act very conscious and that's one of the reasons that emotional intelligence is really important to really understand what your teammates are feeling and be able to interrelate with them because the octopus has the advantage of having neurons that send signals people are stuck with speaking or maybe texting of more you know for communication of late but we are slower communicating than if we had neurons that connected us. So would you say that, you know, a good facilitator is somebody that has this emotional intelligence to be yeah. able to read everyone? Emotional intelligence and good judgment. Mm -hmm. That is maybe emotional intelligence, but the ability to think in some of these other intelligence that I was talking about and be able to um, know that, hey, this is a time to dance or celebrate, or uh, this is um, a, a time to spread out and think about how we're relating spatially to each other, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That helps with the judgment. So do you think to in order that it takes a lot of practice in order to really try to obtain this group consciousness as a team? It does. We, I personally have a kind of rule of thumb that I have to be with a team that's learning how to operate with consent and using uh, various sociocratic rules like making sure you take notes or mm -hmm. thinking through your work in terms of engineering things like input, transformation, output, all that, all that stuff that goes into it. I have to be with them about six times. I usually try to facilitate the first and maybe the second meeting, and during which time we elect a facilitator, and then I help coach the facilitator and the person who's taking notes and doing the circle administration. By about the sixth time, they've got it. It's really important to have somebody that knows what they're doing to start out to demonstrate that it really does work. That's pretty much the, how long it takes a team to build up the basics of consent decision-making and being egalitarian and being sensitive to each other, all that kind of thing. You get there and then they can take off on their own and continue developing. Yeah, definitely. Um, so for at GA, when we are teaching our, doing our facilitator training, do we also teach emotional intelligence? We do. We do it somewhat indirectly. So, for example, if it's time to consent to something, and that's when everybody says, I don't have any objection to this, or I can consent, 
and which is different than consensus, and that's a whole different discussion. It's different than majority vote. It's kind of everybody as a system um, sounding in and saying, "Yeah, I can, we, I can, we can, I can contribute to our common goal with that policy." So you're going around, and you say, "All right, Susie, do you have any objections?" Susie says, "No." When we come over to Katrina, and Katrina says, "No." If I'm the facilitator, I'd say. Mm. That looks like an objection to me. Your body and your mouth are disagreeing because you're looking down at your belly button and you're saying no. So we go back and say, "What's you look like you're feeling sad when you say that. And nine times out of 10, you're going to say, well, this is kind of, I don't know how to say this, but I got a funny feeling about something and here's what it is. And suddenly we're going to see new information. And that's teaching everybody also to be emotionally intelligent. Hey, you know, she look at her body. We're, we're used to just listening to somebody saying yes or no, or I, I'm in favor of this or not, and coming up with arguments. But the body has its own arguments. Emotions have their own arguments, and they need to be listened to also. So that would be one example of how, just by example, we teach emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And there are, are lots of other things, but that the um, like we may get people to say, if, if there's a lot of tension, get people to repeat back the exact words that they just heard. This is, comes from a, a, a discipline called Imago, which is a couples therapy thing, but they have also a whole system called Communilog where people just sit around and each person in turn will say something and somebody else will repeat back as close as they can the same words. And it does amazing things, like it makes people feel heard, it pulls the group together, it deepens the conversation. And so if there are a couple of people who are like starting to get into it, the facilitator can say, all right, you know, George, say what Susie said. Just say it until Susie says you repeated the, you got the words accurately. And then I say, Susie, you know, George has said something, you repeat it back. And pretty soon they're hearing each other totally differently. So that's, that's good to be in a bag of facilitators tricks. So those are two examples of bringing in emotional intelligence techniques that can help everybody grow. A uh, student of, let's see, he was getting his master's degree in pastoral counseling. He was from a big mega church. I, I once had a wonderful time teaching for a week down at Abilene Christian University. You'd think, wow, what are they doing looking at something hippie like, like, you know, sociocracy, but I had a wonderful time. And the you know, they were great people. And that was, that in itself was a lot of fun for me to be stepping on the other side of the U.S. political divide. But this pastor went back to the mega church and he was trying to help uh, the church's board have a meeting, try out the new skills he had learned. And there was one member of the board who everybody just dreaded because he was always against everything. It seemed he was just very difficult to get along with. And so they, and they were generally kind of trying to use a sort of a rough sort of consensus thing. So the pastor says, let's try consent. And they had a decision to make. And this guy kept saying, well, that's not good. You know, we need to do this. And so the pastor would say, okay, well, both them thinking, we'll do that too. And we'll throw it into the, into the decision. And they went around and they added all this guy's thoughts. And then they said, okay, let's let's see if we can consent to this and we'll go around. And they got around to this guy. And he said, I have an objection. And the guy, pastor said, he just thought, oh my God. But when they finished doing the round, this was the guy, only guy that had an objection. The pastor went back to him and said, can you tell us about your objection? And the guy said, yes. He said, this process is the first time on this board I've ever felt listened to. Uh, or, or, or that were listening to me. And as I'm thinking about what happened, you incorporated all my ideas. But when I think about the original proposal, I think, you know, my ideas weren't really that good. I think we should go back to the original proposal. <laughs> so he, he was, he had the feeling of he was listened to and he was able to step back and say, well, maybe that wasn't so good. <laughs> so that's the effect of making sure everybody is heard. That's just a very clear example. Yeah, and I feel like that's just a basic human need too, you know, that people just 
want to connect and feel heard and listened to. Yeah. So I think and, that... And that to finish the story, some of the people there said, well, wait a minute, we actually like some of your ideas. And so they sort of fiddled around with it more and came up with something that everybody was very happy with. They left the meeting very happy. Yeah, and that's, you know, the the objective so that it feels right to everybody. That's something that's that's really big in sociocracy and facilitating consent is feeling how you how you feel about something. You know, our 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 brain and our emotions and our consciousness, even though they're they're not tangible, they present themselves in our body. And that's one of the things I really like about sociocracy because it's also telling you to like check in like with yourself. Yeah. And yeah. I think a lot of people don't do, they don't really listen to their, their intuitions or what their body is trying to tell them. They just kind of push it to the side because, you know, the, the boss won't listen or no right. one wants to listen to them or so many other reasons. Right. So, well, great. This was awesome. Thank you so much, John. I, the, the consciousness is such a huge subject. Like you said, it's something we, we can't, like, it's not tangible. We can't touch it. We can't find it in the body. We know it's there, but we can't find it. And it's so great to learn that there's so much that goes into sociocracy and creating a good meeting and this group got consciousness so that we can maybe work like an octopus <laughs> <laughs> a little bit better. <laughs> you know, maybe not perfect, but that's okay. You know, we try to get, we'll try to get as close as we can. Uh, and yes, thank you so much. And just to let everybody know, at Governance Alive, we offer so much. We have so many trainings and workshops for, for everyone who would like to join. And we would love to have you. You know, John, John is wonderful and is a load of information. So if you'd like, please check out Governance Alive. And we will see everyone next time. Thank you so much.